Hello and welcome to the Bibliophile series, episode 42. So for a very long time, I wanted to do Aeon essays in these articles, but with Aeon essays, the biggest challenge is that the essays are extremely long. So this is perhaps one of the shorter essays, it's perhaps one of the shorter essays, which was only 2100 words. Night School about Kenneth Miller, this article is about uh, how we can train our brain to be consuming information and learning stuff even while we are sleeping. But say 2100 words is too much. So what I've done is I have used an online AI tool to compress that article, compress that article roughly around 650, 650-ish words. Let me check, around 762 words. And uh, all the major parts of the article have been incorporated into the portion that I'm going to read, but of course, the article link that was shared with you was for the full article for 2100 words, and perhaps this way I can include more A on essays going forward. Let's go. Learning a new language can be a daunting task, especially when time, in a, time is a constraint. This challenge led one individual with a lifelong fascination for Italian to explore unconventional methods like sleep learning. Sleep learning is when you try to learn something while you're asleep. Once dismissed by scientists, sleep learning is making a surprising comeback. Supported by new research. However, this resurgence raises important questions about the potential benefits and risks of manipulating our brains during sleep. Okay. So this article is more about the challenges posed by trying to manipulate our brain during sleep rather than why learning at night would be appropriate. Okay. The concept of sleep learning dates back to biblical times, but it wasn't until 1932 that it took a commercial form. Commercial form is something that is accessible to common public. You can simply buy it. Let's say space travel is not in its commercial form right now. People, as in and some wealthy folks can do it, we can't do it. Air travel is commercial. Space travel is not commercial. Okay. Alua Benjamin Salinger, a Czech born inventor, introduced the psychophone, a device designed to play whispered messages while a person slept. It promised to instill confidence and other desirable traits based on the assumption that brain was as suggestible during sleep as it was under hypnosis. So it was operating with the assumption that the brain was as suggestible during sleep as it was under hypnosis. Under hypnosis, of course, the brain is very suggestible. You can get people to quack like ducks and dance like chicken and do all sorts of funny things. And perhaps when you're sleeping, the brain is also suggest suggestible during that time, similar to how you are suggestible under hypnosis. Although this idea gained popularity, it was eventually debunked by scientific research in the 1950s it shows that brain is incapable of learning new information while in a true sleep state. So it was a hypothesis that was thrown out. It gained popularity, but then it was disproved. It was shown that this is not valid. Recent advancements in neuroscience have rekindled interest in sleep learning. Studies have shown that the brain is highly active during sleep, particularly during the deep, dreamless stage known as the slow wave sleep. So sleep also has stages. The deep dreamless stage is known as the slow brain sleep. During this time, the brain rehearses and consolidates new memories, a process that has sparked the idea that learning during sleep might be more feasible than previously thought. This has rekindled the interest and we are back to postulating or hypothesizing that perhaps some learning can be done during sleep. Experiments have demonstrated that certain types of conditioning can occur during sleep. For example, studies have shown that pairing sounds or smells with specific learning tasks during sleep can enhance memory recall upon waking. Okay. This you would perhaps also know when you're studying, if you're listening to a song or if you're listening to, if you're uh, having some sort of food, smells trigger memories, sounds trigger memories, which is why every love song that you hear during your teenage heartbreak will hold special meaning for you, but the other people may not necessarily uh, relate with it as much. 
Okay. So similar to that here, what we have is while sleeping, if you associate sounds with specific learning tasks, they can enhance memory recall. This suggests that the sleeping brain is capable of reinforcing, if not entirely learning, certain types of information. So previously, what was the most new information cannot be learned, but reinforcing something that we have learned, perhaps this can be done using, uh, using the new techniques or during slow wave sleep. Perhaps this can be achieved. Again, this is not proven that this can definitely be achieved. What is being postulated here is there is a possibility that this can happen. Several recent studies have pushed the boundaries of what we understand about sleep learning. One experiment involved teaching mice to associate a specific location with a reward by stimulating their brains during sleep. The mice later sought out this location when they awoke, despite not having learned the association while awake. Similar experiments with humans have shown that smells and sounds can trigger memory in reinforcement during sleep, improving recall of learned tasks. So, associating smell or sound with something during your sleep includes memory recall of learned tasks and experiments of this nature have been held for mice and also for humans. In another study, nicotine addicts were exposed to the smell of cigarettes paired with the cotton odors during sleep. This aversive conditioning led to a reduction in smoking, demonstrating that sleep learning could potentially be used for behavior modification. Okay. These studies provide a proof of concept, not definitive proof, but proof of concept that sleep learning might be possible under certain conditions, though it remains far from a practical reality. It's not like it is entirely proven and we are some way off from turning it into something that we can readily use, but there is potential there. That is what these studies or these experiments have shown us. The potential applications of sleep learning are vast. Imagine being able to learn new language or acquire complex skills while you sleep. This could revolutionize education and personal development, allowing people to achieve proficiency in half the time it currently takes. Why half the time it currently takes? Because you devote some time to it while waking. Then you devote some time to it while sleeping. Perhaps you are able, now that the time available for you to invest into learning something is more. This will reduce the time that it takes you to become proficient at something. Previously, you had, let's say, in a 24 hour day, you slept for eight hours, you worked for eight hours, and eight hours went down the drain. In eating, sleeping, in eating, talking to people, doing random activities, trans, uh, transportation, all those sorts of things. So, eight hours of active learning with eight hours of passive learning during sleep. Because the effort available or the time available for learning something has doubled, the time it would take for you to learn something to accomplish the total task should have. However, the risks associated with sleep learning are significant. Okay, and this is where the author had started off with. There are challenges here. The brain's primary function during sleep is to consolidate memories and maintain cognitive health. Interfering with this process could have unintended consequences such as impairing the brain's ability to learn new information or leading to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. If you mess around with the brain, maybe it leads to degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or whatever. See, given, see one of the huge challenges with brain research is you can't do experiments on living people as a group. Brains of living people. So, there is very little information available about brains. More often than not, what we have is second hand information. Let's say somebody had an accident and the right top side of their skull was infected and then they have difficulty in speaking. So, over the years, what scientists have done, this person has difficulty in speaking. So, this part of the brain is responsible for speech and language learning. Some somewhere else, if on the back side of your back right side of your head, if you get hit and your balance becomes a little wonky, then okay, this part of the brain is responsible for balance. So all the accumulated information that we have about brains is from accidents and second hand accounts. No direct experiments have been done on this. Because of that, we go on to say 
let's conduct uh, let's uh, do stuff to the brain so that we learn the while we are sleeping we don't even know the net impact of that how that may eventually turn out you may end up uh, impairing your ability to learn new things or perhaps uh, turn the brain as in you could lead it could lead to neurodegenerative diseases like alzheimers we don't really know so meddling in that domain mean is not really ideal is what the author is implying moreover there are psychological and societal implications to consider sleep is not just a time for rest but a vital period for mental and emotional rejuvenation the commercialization of sleep learning could lead to a world where even sleep is commodified pushing the boundaries of productivity at the expense of well being okay perhaps what this could lead to is uh, employers asking their employees to sleep with some tools so that even when they are sleeping they are on job they are doing some sort of work and while this will improve the productivity for corporations but the individuals well being might be affected remember all of these are simply hypotheses none of it is proven it is not yet proven that we can learn while sleeping but it is also not yet proven that the damages to the brain would be real sleep learning challenges our traditional understanding of our, of the sanctity of sleep in many cultures night and sleep are seen as sacred times for introspection and spiritual growth perhaps you can remember this even in mahabharata and ramayana times when there were wars happening when it was evening time when it was sleep time all the arms were put down and both the warring sides decided okay we will start fighting again next morning right now it is the time for sleep there is sanctity of sleep this time should not this time should not be used in fighting with the other side the idea of using sleep for continuous self improvement could undermine these values turning sleep into just another tool for productivity okay. the concept of hypnopedia as depicted in aldous huxley's brave new world represents the extreme of this weak centric mindset i don't know what hypnopedia is but i'm guessing hypnopedia would refer to the concept of hypnopedia uh, refers to your brain should always be productively engaged either you are working on something or you are trying to learn something even when you are sleeping represents the extreme of this weak centric mindset it raises ethical questions about the extent to which we should benefit our natural processes for personal gain should we embrace sleep learning as a way to enhance our lives or should we preserve sleep as a time for retreat from the demands of the waking world okay. see the author is doing one wonderful thing he has given all arguments against sleep training right now most recently he has given all arguments against sleep training right now and then he pulls it in the form of a question putting it through as acha dekho ye advantages hain ye disadvantages hain the list of disadvantages is significantly larger and then going to should be do x or should be not to do x when clearly his own opinion is we should not be doing x so he can't say the author is being a little as in author is being analytical here the author is very much sharing his opinion he is not looking at both sides he very much has a side that he is rooting for the revival of sleep learning presents a fascinating yet troubling prospect on one hand it offers the possibility of expanding our knowledge and skills in unprecedented ways on the other hand it risks compromising the very essence of sleep with potential consequences for our mental physical and spiritual health as we stand on the brink of this new frontier we must carefully consider the costs and benefits of integrating sleep learning into our lives the author is very much against the idea of doing this perhaps in the end the best course of action is to heed the wisdom of those who cherish sleep as a time of peace and restoration and to protect it from becoming yet another frontier for exploitation okay understand why there are a few questions and let's say double speak in world to towards the end of the passage you cannot be any doubt the author is very much against the idea of sleep learning now if you want to look at the issue at a macro level science is science science will definitely try to research this phenomenon if sleep sleep learning can happen 
But then, you know, the challenge is initially, sleep only will not be cheap. It will only be available to the top brass, to the richest people. They anyway have a leg up when they have more financial resources. Then, uh, more goods will be available to them to eat the market. Very much like coaching, for that matter. See, coaching, then, achha, forget coaching. The comparison perhaps will not get through very nicely. But uh, let's say, uh, think of it this way you have a cricketer based out of city coming from a fairly well off family and a cricketer from village a village both of them have good natural skills but the first guy also is a nutritionist also as a physiotherapist also as a mental conditioning coach all sorts of things he has the second guy only plays cricket for fun in the village now because of the support system because of availability of finances forget remember the talent level is pretty much identical but because of availability of finances the first guy has a much higher likelihood of breaking into the team, breaking into the better teams and getting a, making a career out of it than the second guy. Because for a lot of uh, small city people, they don't even know if opportunities exist. As in, they wouldn't even know when their district team is being selected. They wouldn't even know when their state team is being selected. But uh, the first guy who is rich will have those opportunities available to them. So my first concern is, how do you democratize it? But then the challenge also remains. See, if we start fiddling with it, especially for brain, where we don't have a lot of research, it's very much like uh, space research because we don't have big bang theory that we have is a theory. It is not a definitively proved uh, scientific fact. It is a theory because you can't do research in deep space. Similarly, brain, you can't do research on a live brain and therefore it is just a theory. It's just an idea that is being worked upon. So, as long as we don't have very good understanding of the brain, staying away from it perhaps would be sensible. The in unintended consequences or the inevitable uh, truth of this, however, is as long as science can push the boundaries, they will go ahead and do that. There will perhaps be some calamitous outcome because of this. But later on, Slowly it will subside and we will get to a point where it becomes democratically and ubiquitously available. Perhaps then the need for seeking external help for learning will no longer exist. This article was 762 words, had 41 sentences. I'm talking of the abridged version, not the actual version. The actual version had 2100 plus words. Well, the abridged version was at a reading level of 9.36. The ideas, of course, were uh, slightly complex and you needed a frame of reference in order to completely understand them. This is plain English, but veering towards difficult to read. Veering towards difficult to read and is suitable for the average adult. They can understand it. Most of us, I'm guessing, would understand it. Maybe not the implication. And this, is a, this is very ripe for an English RC passage. Because here, is the author aligned with the idea or not? Which of the following most mimic the reasoning provided by author? Then you give something about deep space research. All of that could work. That is all for this episode. Hopefully you learned something. See you again in the next episode. Thank you.